So today we're going to be simply talking about wisdom and, and folly. It's not, not, uh, it's not necessarily anything new from the book of Ecclesiastes, but it, it, it's kind of like as, as Solomon, who we believe wrote the book, as he's kind of wrapping up this letter and wrapping up this journey that he's kind of sharing about. It's almost like he's kind of throwing out all these like last minute random kind of thoughts. So it's not like there's this great structure that takes place in, in the end of chapter 9, chapter 10. He kind of jumps around back and forth to, to different topics, uh, practical topics, but it all surrounds wisdom and uh, folly. Uh, we all know, we all know foolishness can have lasting effects. Like, like we all know if we make a foolish decision, it can have a, a lasting effect. Like we know texting and driving can be a foolish decision with detrimental uh, effects. We know drinking and driving, we're stating the obvious, can have terrible uh, impact to our lives. We know getting into a car with someone that's been drinking is not a very wise decision. Trying any drug or maybe just getting involved in some kind of stupid prank that goes wrong or maybe being part of a, a dare or even things like taking shortcuts at work can be extremely foolish. Just uh, think about, I just think about Boeing. I, I mean, there's, there's all this stuff now around the Boeing Airlines of where they've, they've taken these shortcuts. There's all this controversy. And there's, there's missing bolts with doors flying off mid-flight. I mean, that makes you really confident when you get into a plane. Or, or, or something like that. Or uh, even just like rushing around doing something can be extremely foolish. Uh, this week, all, all I was doing was I wanted to replace the mower blade on my mower. It's a stupid little push mower. A and my wife was fearful and didn't want me to do it at all because last time or a few times ago when I did it, I, some of you might remember, I was rushing and I was being stupid and I slipped and sliced all the fingers on my hand on the blade. And then I had to come into church and it was really embarrassing because I'm standing up here with all my fingers kind of wrapped up and, and all those things. But like rushing around can be foolish. Lying on a resume and then you get the job and you can't do the job, it is pretty foolish. I think we can all probably recall a time or two where we've made foolish decisions, where we just kind of regret the decision we made. We, we would like to take it back, where we just kind of lacked wisdom. Wisdom isn't always a, a, a glamorous choice. It may seem mundane at times. And, and you can probably say, you know, life in general, it, it's a lot of just a series of choices. And every single day, you and I, we, we get to choose to either go on the path, take the path of wisdom or the path of foolishness. And, and what Solomon's getting at today is he's trying to get you to kind of discern which path defines you. Which one defines you? When you look at your life and the decisions you make, ultimately your spiritual decisions, are you on a path of wisdom or a path of foolishness? And, and that's where he takes us today. So, so let's begin. Let's look at chapter 9, uh, verse 13, and let's read to the end of chapter 9 together. You can follow along on the screen. It says this, chapter 9, verse 13. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, Though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So, so here's the thing. He, he starts off with this example. This example of, of potentially something that he observed and, and saw firsthand. Um, he, he says basically this, wisdom doesn't guarantee that you're going to get recognition. 
Like wisdom doesn't guarantee that people are going to be lining up and thanking you for how wise you are and how we would have never, they would have never made it through whatever situation it was that you were in without your wisdom. And that no one could have ever done it without you. The reality of wisdom is it often goes unnoticed. And here it says there was this poor man, an unknown poor man, who wisely led a city to victory that had no business winning whatsoever. This is like a, a 15 seed beating a 1 seed in the, in the college basketball tournament. This is like the miracle on ice. This is like Buster Douglas knocking out Mike Tyson. Am I going too far back? Like, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? No one. I, I get it. It's way back. But that's like the good times. Think of it like it, this is like David defeating Goliath. This is slingshot against the latest military equipment. You would think this guy would have a, a statue. You would think this guy would, might have some books written about him. You think this guy would at least have a name that we could read. This is a, like a, a great underdog story. Of brain beating brawn, and yet it says he's forgotten. No recognition, not even a participation trophy, nothing at all. Zero recognition. Here's the thing zero recognition doesn't mean wisdom isn't valuable, it, it, it may not get you noticed. But here it proved better than military strength alone. Strategy and wise counsel beat strength. This was a whole city that benefited to listening to his wisdom. It goes to show that you and I, we would be wise to listen to sound counsel. And and he gives us a little tip here. He, He says this. He says the loudest voice usually isn't the wisest. Like, like, have you experienced that? Like, there are people that are extremely loud, and they want to shout, and they want to get their voice heard because they're kind of like on on this power trip. But oftentimes, the loudest voice isn't the wisest, wisest. People like to throw their weight around. People like to throw their weight around by being loud. And yet the loud minority, a foolish, sinful, loudmouth, we know can inflict much damage. Damage in the church, damage in the workplace, damage in the home. I'll say this, and maybe some of you agree with me. Um, maybe this is wrong. Honestly, I don't know. Maybe it's, something, it's an issue I need to deal with. But, but I would say this. If someone approaches me, I'm just confessing here. If someone approaches me with concerns, if someone approaches me with a concern or multiple concerns, and they come loud and demanding, I will admit, I pay very little attention to them. It's very hard to pay attention to them. If someone else comes to me with the exact same concerns, exact same concerns, if they come humble and sincere with constructive criticism, I'm all ears. I'm all ears because I want to hear what they have to say. I fully am convinced they are worth listening to, and I got to think about the things that they are saying. One approach heightens conflict. The other leads to resolution. And, And here you saw an unknown. An unknown chose the path of wisdom, and he saved a city. Solomon just simply goes on in chapter 10 and and just really practical stuff. He warns us to stay away from folly. He says this, look at verses 1 through 3. And it sounds strange, I get it. But he says this. He says, dead flies make the uh, perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. So he's warning us. He's warning us to stay away from folly, right? Because you get to make choices every single day, and your choices have lasting uh, effects. So stay away from folly. He's basically saying stay away from that which is going to pull you in the wrong direction. Stay away from that which is going to pull you away from from God. Foolishness, folly quickly turns things sour. 
Have you ever smelled a dead mouse that is either caught in the walls or the ceiling of a building? Like it just reeks. Sometimes in the church office, it's the old farmhouse down the front of the property. Sometimes a mouse or something will die up in the attic. And if you come upstairs, you can smell it for days, maybe even a week. It just is rank. It smells horrible. Or you ever open a gallon of milk, poured it in your cereal, and chunks has come out. Like, and it just has that sour, awful smell. Hopefully you didn't take a big swig of it. But it kind of happens. It stinks. Here the example is just perfume that flies got into. And, and they died in there and they're caught in it. And they're saying it is rank. He's just trying to tell you folly turns things sour quickly. One foolish choice, one stupid comment, one lapse of common sense, one word, one act can leave a lingering stench everywhere. You know what's interesting is, is the church in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the church is called to be a sweet aroma. The church is called to be a fragrance to those around us that attract people to the one t- true God. And yet what happens sometimes with the church? Although we're supposed to be a sweet aroma, sometimes the church is what? Sometimes the church is just a bunch of dead flies stinking up the neighborhood. Sometimes it's just a bunch of dead flies stinking up the the neighborhood. We want to be salt and light. We want to display the, the, the love of Christ. We want to do that by being different. Not by trying to be relative and fit into everything that's going on. We do it by living out what Scripture calls us to live out and upholding our faith in genuine, loving ways. He continues and he says, A wise man's heart inclines him to the right and the fool to the left. Do not take this as your political mantra. All right? That is not political. It's not what he's talking about. All right, don't use that verse for when the coming elections come. He's talking about right and wrong ways to live. Like we said earlier, you're either living in a way that's drawing you closer to God or you're living you or you're you're living in a way that's pulling you further away from God. You get to choose every day. You can choose the path of foolishness or the path of wisdom. One sets affections on God, the other sets affections on things of the world. And I think you just have to simply ask yourself, ask yourself, like, do I have an appetite for God's word? Like, do I really have a desire for for God's word? Am I really seeking to learn from him? Do, Do I pursue holiness? Do I find myself pursuing holiness or do I find myself more dabbling in sin? And kind of playing around, around with sin. Or even ask yourself, like, like who do you surround yourself with? Who, who do you surround yourself with? And who are you around more than, than, than you're not? And what do you consume most? What are you consuming most? They're just questions to ask because the path that we choose, it will be revealed through our words and, and through our actions. He goes on, he does talk a little bit about government. He says foolish people in power are are pretty much dangerous, a lot of them. Uh, Look at verses 4 to 7. He he says this. He says, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place. This is stuff that he's actually said before. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offense to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun. As it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He's saying foolish people in power are dangerous. When foolish people are in power, everything gets flipped upside down. When those in power celebrate uh, immorality and they disregard God, you see the effect that it has on a society. When that's the kind of authority in power, societies tend to falter and societies tend to crumble. We can see things like that happening today. And yet this is what he has said, and he has said it strongly throughout this book. Even so, church, 
Even so, even if we have what we believe is corrupt leadership in a faulty government, and we know that we live in a broken world, so every system and every institution is going to be broken. Even if we live in a broken world with broken leadership, we are called to live out our faith graciously. We're called to live out our faith graciously. This is, we don't engage in folly. We don't speak uh, words of folly. We speak words of wisdom. We stay calm. We pray. We engage wisely in political talk and political conversation and the whole political process. We engage wisely. Anger. Hasty actions, violence, sarcastic comments, mockeries, none of them make Jesus Christ look great. None of that makes Jesus look great. None of it makes the church look great. It actually makes the church look really bad. He has told us, chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, there is a time for everything. There's absolutely a time to walk away. There's absolutely a time to push back. There is a time to take a stand, but we are to do it wisely, displaying and showcasing the grace of God. Verses 8 to 11, he continues on. He says, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarrels stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. So, so what's he talking about here? Just simply, he's saying we need to always walk wisely and, and be alert. Because we know in this life there's highs and lows and there's ups and downs. And we can easily and quickly fall into traps. Sometimes it's wise to act urgently, and sometimes it's wise to take time to think through, to process, and, and to prepare. You and I know life is unpredictable. You could go into work. He's basically with those examples there. You could go into work just like every other day. Like all throughout the week, most of us, we wake up, and it's pretty much the same routine, whatever your routine is in the morning. You, you, you wake up. You, maybe you get showered, you get dressed, maybe you eat something, maybe you do devotions, maybe you don't. Maybe that's more in the evening or lunchtime, whatever. But you hop in your car, you drive to work, you do your work, you come home. And it's kind of on repeat throughout the day. That's what he's talked about in the beginning of Ecclesiastes. It's like things like life is vain. It just seems like things are on, on, on repeat. But this is, you could be in that mode and you can be on repeat and you could go into work, kind of like your blah work that you might think is pretty blah, and do it every single day. And yet this day, something happens. This day, there's an accident. This day, some unforeseen circumstance takes place. So this is a, hey, don't be lazy, don't be aloof, be alert, always be aware of your surroundings. You can't prepare for everything. You can't prepare for everything, but being wise is better. And that's true spiritually. Like dabbling in sin, if you're dabbling in sin, if you're thinking you're never going to get caught and you're just dabbling with sin and, and you're playing with it on, on the side here and you're acting this way in church and this way around your family and, and a different way when you're out over here or you're by yourself, it's eventually going to bite you. It's eventually going to bite you. It's going to catch up to you. It can send you down into a deep pit with that it will almost be like without the mercy of God or a mere God, you're not getting out of it. This is wise living pursues God's, sharpens our understanding of him. And we need to choose wisely in our actions, in our thoughts, in our eyes, and what we do, and even with what we say. And that's where he goes in. He ends this chapter, verses 12 to 20, talking about our speech and, and leadership once again. Listen to what he says, verse 12 of chapter 10. It says, the words of a wise man's mouth. Win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, 
And who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility and your, prison, uh, your princes feast at the proper time. For strength and not for drunkenness, through sloth the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter and wine gladness, gladdens life. And money answers everything. Even in your thoughts, do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich. For a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature tell that matter. I read someone say that this is basically the passage where Twitter came from. Because everything that you say gets exposed. But uh, I think that's odd, and now it's called X. So anyway, but it, it, he's basically saying this. Our, our speech easily declares the path that we are on. I mean, think about it. When you hear someone talk, you instantly judge them. You, you, you judge them. You make judgments, right or wrong, just by their speech, the way they are saying things, the way they are speaking a, about people. This is, we know this. You can read the book of James, too. A wise person is slow to speak. A wise person chooses his words carefully. A wise person thinks before they speak. A wise person shows grace. A wise person speaks truth. A wise person doesn't embellish. A wise person encourages, doesn't just criticize. A wise person is gentle yet firm. Much of your reputation is based on your speech and your actions, obviously. People make judgments based on our speech. You can read James chapter 3. Uh, verses really all of chapter 3, but 5 through 10, or uh, jump around a little bit. It talks about how the tongue is dangerous and the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. It says in verse 7 of chapter 3 of James, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Isn't this true right here, verse 9? With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. I mean, how quickly do we go there? How quickly do blessings and cursings flow out of our mouths? And you know what's scary even for me is like how, how quickly sarcasm or how quickly just wrongful things can just, just come out of my mouth. And I don't even have to think about it. It just reveals the that sin that's there. And, and we just easily fall I I into foolish speech. We can say something rash, we can put people down, we, we gossip, we, we, we can easily slander. We can easily say things that were told to us that weren't meant to be public, and we go public with them. And sometimes we go public because we think it's going to benefit us and make us look good, or sometimes we just want to put down that other person's reputation. So sometimes we, we take things public that shouldn't go public. Other times we just wrongly criticize uh, authority. Like we know words are damaging. And once they're out, once they're out, you can't take them back. I, I mean, you've heard, you've seen the example. It's like toothpaste. Once it's out of the tube, you're not putting it back in the tube. It doesn't work that way. He says the walls have ears. Like, like be wise. The walls have ears. What, what, what's said in secret eventually escapes. What is said in secret behind what you think is closed doors, if you're bringing other people into it, it's eventually getting out. And, and, and that can be extremely damaging. Damaging to the church, dam, damaging to your family, damaging to friends and, and, and relationships. Like this is just so practical of, uh, of church. Just think through the words you're about to say. Think through the motive behind why you're about to say it. Is it at all benefiting anyone, yourself or those or the person you're talking about? Think through the speech. 
This is don't ignore wise rebuke or wise counsel. He, he ends this section going back to leadership. He has a lot to say about leadership. And he just says a young ruler, right? There was a young ruler here. It was a young ruler who thought that, that he had it all. It sounds like it was an arrogant young ruler who thought that he, he had it all. He ignored wise counsel. He lived slothful. He lived wasted. Even early in the morning, he was getting drunk. It wasn't even like he had breakfast yet. And he was already putting it down. He's getting wasted. He's laughing his way, laughing his way through his reign, abusing his power, abusing his leadership. It was all partying, partying. Right, using money for everything because in his mind, money buys everything. You need money for everything, which there's some truth to that. And he's laughing through, but the reality is this: all the money, all the laughter, all the partying, partying. I like saying all, all that. Like, is if that's how you're living in that foolish state, eventually it all goes away. Eventually, it catches up to you. And he says, "Happy is the land whose ruler leads with wisdom." We know that happy is the land whose ruler leads with wisdom. Happy is the church. Happy is the family. Happy is the workplace who leads with wisdom. Every day, church, every day you get to choose the path of wisdom or foolishness. And, and, and maybe today, as we wrap this up today, maybe that just seems so simple to you. Like, yeah, I get it. it, it it's pretty basic. But think about it. Every day you are making choices. Not just in your everyday life, but you're making choices spiritually. You're making choices physically. You're making choices mentally. That you choose wisdom or foolishness. And you need to ask yourself, what path are you choosing? Like what path, if you really reflect on your life, what path defines you? Do you find yourself moving closer to God or further away? Do you find yourself pursuing the path that draws you closer to God? Or do you find yourself pursuing the path where you're dabbling in, in sin and you're playing with, with fire? Are you pursuing God? Are you dabbling in sin? What defines your life? See, at the core of all this, at the core, the wisest decision, you and I know this, the wisest decision one could make ever, the wisest decision one could ever make is to repent of sin and to give their life to Jesus Christ. Believing that his life and death and resurrection is the answer to all things brings us forgiveness of sins. The wisest decision anyone could ever make is the decision to follow Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. It says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The ultimate goal of wisdom is salvation. Think about it. This is talking to Timothy here. So he's talking about like, like his grandparents. They raised him in understanding the scriptures. And, and you could look, you could say here, you know what, majority of you in this room right now, you, you, you sit in here on a weekly basis. So you're hearing the word of God. You're interacting with, with, with the scriptures. And what's the purpose of all that? That they are able to make you wise, the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through Jesus Christ. They point you to salvation in Christ. The path of wisdom puts you on the narrow path that leads to eternal life. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate. And we'll close with this. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are, are many. The foolish road is easy. It's easy to go there. Wisdom can be mundane at times. It's not always recognized. The, the, the foolish road is easy. It's wide. It's there. It says many enter it. But for the, gate, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So there's, a, the, there's the, the wide path that many people can jump on. And then there's a narrow, wise path that, that leads to salvation in Jesus Christ. So we read that. We can say, you know what, church? Choose this day whom you will serve. 
We know that passage. Choose this day whom you will serve and choose wisely. Is your life defined by the path of wisdom or the path of foolishness? Choose this day whom you will serve and choose wisely. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, uh, Lord, I pray that we don't just uh, dismiss the words of, of Ecclesiastes today as something that maybe we've heard before. But God, let us take what, what is practical here and let us look at our lives. And God, really discern what, what path are we honestly on. Not, not just what we think or what we might say, but look at what our words and, and our actions reveal. And I, God, I pray that each person here, we would be on that path to wisdom, the path that ultimately leads to salvation and, and showing us who Christ is, uh, where we would repent and ask for those forgiveness of sins. And God, that we would be on that path that would lead us to walk in his ways and displaying that to the world around us. God, through our words, through our actions, through the things that we do, how we interact with one another, how we interact in our families, in our workplaces, in school, in the church, wherever it might be. God, that the way that we do things, it will draw people to you. That we would be that sweet aroma and, and not a stench, Lord. Uh, that people would be drawn uh, to, to who you are through what they see in us. Not that we're perfect people, but even in our failures and our struggles, God, we showcase your goodness and your grace and your faithfulness always. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.